Hello, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. It is I, Emily Sophia, or M. Mighty Sophia, here to break down for you guys the season premiere of Better Call Saul. We are on season two, episode one, Switch, I believe the title is. So, spoiler alert before I dive into the mad thick of things, as I shall be bearing all in this hopefully pretty concise review. Got a lot of ground to cover, and I'm gonna do my best to cover as much of it as possible, although I know that I am more than likely to miss so many of the fun Easter eggs and Breaking Bad references that this episode was riddled with, so I highly encourage you to bring up any of your observations in the comments below and anything that I fail to address here. So let's get going. Um, I was incredibly pleased with this premiere, and I mean, I expected nothing less. This show has proven itself to be centered on a story that is worth telling. And I do, in fact, believe that Better Call Saul has emerged as so much more than a mere spinoff. And in fact, sometimes I think that the word spinoff comes with a lot of negative connotations or, you know, the... The idea that a show exists for the purpose of capitalizing on a really ridiculously successful um, predecessor. And, and yet here we have such a diamond encrusted gem as Better Call Saul that is so filled with heart, so poignant, so beautifully and tragically told. I mean, especially if you know what's to come. And the show continues to show us exactly what is to come. It spells it out in no uncertain terms, even for those who have not seen Breaking Bad. Um, I love the fact that we travel into the future and it is black and white. It's a very simple color choice that is so profoundly <laughs> significant. I mean, I, I imagine I'm not the only person to read into, you know, why they're differentiating the flash forwards um, from the present in this manner. And, and I mean, seeing how Slippin' Jimmy, Jimmy McGill, James McGill, Saul Goodman all boils down to Gene, the Cinnabon, manager in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, the, fir the first five minutes of this episode, seeing Jimmy where he ends up and then getting locked in the garbage room in this empty mall. And he, he is so rattled from his former life, so, so averse to even remotely playing outside of the rules that he can't even bring himself to push open the emergency door because alarms will be sounded and cops will come. And that is a life that he can no longer deal with. And so he is content to sit stuck in this room, sitting on this, this overturned carton, waiting for somebody to set him free. And it's such a crazy metaphor for his life and feeling feeling trapped by the life that he has to escape. And he is worlds away from the James McGill that we see in this episode, in the present of the story, where he ultimately decides after coming out from under the rule of his brother, Chuck McGill, he decides that he is in fact going to take a position with the Davis and Maine law firm, having initially turned down the position in order to, you know, sip some some bubbly and just kind of chill on the lazy river of life, waiting for opportunity to come to him. But no, he decides that he is going to seize opportunity and that he is going to further himself within the law profession, that he is going to use his talents in the way that he wants, whether for good, bad, or things in between. And of course, all of that is epitomized by as um, Jimmy is getting acquainted with his new office at the firm and <laughs> his assistant is reading off all the list of accommodations that he can get and how he can change out the art and, you know, what do you want in the fridge? What do, you, do you need a humidifier? And et cetera, et cetera. And Jimmy is just so blown away at this, at this treatment. <laughs> and as soon as the guy leaves, he sees a little switch. And it's got a note on it that says, never touch. And what does he immediately do? He peels it right on back, flips the switch, waits a minute, looks around, listens, 
nothing evident takes place. And then he flips the switch back off, tapes it sign back on, goes on like nothing happened. And that little action is just a taste of what's to come. And yet another, or yet another step taken in the direction of James McGill becoming Saul Goodman. Um, and then we see the, the sad echo of the <laughs> retired too soon Saul Goodman in the flash forward where after Jimmy is finally released from the garbage room, the camera slowly, slowly zooms in on a little carving in the wall which says SG was here. And that's all that's left. And yet we, we go back and we're just at the beginning. So it's really fascinating to see how this, this show is enmeshed in Jimmy's identity search. Now that he knows the truth about his brother, about, about the lie of his entire life, and trying to get away from Slip and Jimmy, and then all, all of these revelations come to a head, and he realizes that there's very little that he genuinely cares for in this world, much less even his own reputation or professional standing. So initially, he walks away from the law and decides that he's going to use his skills to take advantage of other people, you know, however innocently, <laughs> which of course first involves after Kim tries to stage an intervention at the, uh, the bar of this resort where Jimmy's been spending his time, he sees some investment schmuck on the phone barking orders at somebody and, you know, takes a look at the menu and sees that they've got these $50 tequila shots. What the crap is up with that? The waiter says, you know, it's all just a matter of personal preference. At which point, Jimmy decides that he's going to go up and spin this elaborate story about this, you know, million dollar inheritance from his uncle. And, you know, it's Victor, <laughs> Victor and Giselle St. Clair as uh, Kim takes on her identity to play a part in, in the con with him. And essentially, all they're, they're really doing is, it's innocent enough, they're... Getting that bottle of top shelf tequila <laughs> from a guy who is none the wiser. And so Kim gets a taste of, of Jimmy's lazy river life, of waiting for opportunity to come to him, of <laughs> playing the lioness in the pride lands, looking to hunt down some innocent gazelle. <laughs> mm. And it's so much fun. And it's so it's so delightful to get to see Jimmy gets some semblance of what he wants, even if it's not exactly the right thing. Um, at, at the same time, we want we want to see him succeed. We want to see him do well in some capacity. <laughs> and um, you know, you know, the moral consequences of things are shady at best. But um, in the meantime, we see another another plot line that is beginning to open up as Jimmy is exploring his relationship with Kim, his relationship with his many different selves and facades, and his relationship with what he thought he wanted all along, which was a successful career in law. We see all of these things at play. And then, meanwhile, we see the IT pharmaceutical drug supplier guy, Price, a.k.a. Daniel, who is um stepping up his game a wee bit. He gets a little overconfident in his ability to to make his runs and uh, decides to fire his protection, Mike, not realizing the investment that he is making in his own security and safety, and also getting a crazy souped up Hummer and shoes to match. <laughs> so... This guy has got a fascinating approach. Um, you know, we thought we thought that Heisenberg got off to a bumpy start. And this guy, he, he seems pretty self-assured, but is incredibly misguided. As we can quickly tell by the fact that he, he thinks that there's a trust established between him and Nacho now that he's Nacho's not bringing other men to their meetups and so on and so forth. So I think, hey, more and more money, more profit for me. This is all working smoothly and... All he has to do is invite Nacho into his vehicle, he takes a look at his registration, and then send somebody on over to raid Daniel's place. And then he proceeds to get the cops involved, and 
tries to present an elaborate story about the missing baseball card collection. Quite the euphemism there, buddy. <laughs> and, um, I mean, the cops catch on so dang quick, especially judging by the fact that the guy is trying to sway their entire investigation in one very specific direction. Something ain't right about. There is quite a few things that weren't right about that situation, as we all well knew, and the cops well knew, and I think that it's distinctly possible that very soon Daniel is not only going to require the physical protection that Mike offers, but perhaps the legal protection that James McGill offers now. He's got his his fancy office and he is he's back in the business. I mean, and I, I like that this episode um continues to have this the subplot going forward and we know that things are going to come to a head and that all the different elements of the story are going to collide, but yeah, this is such a great premiere, reminding me of all the reasons why I love this show. Um, so well focused, so developed, and I have so many questions and fears and apprehensions, and as much as I want it to be happy at the end of the episode, it's like that switch. <laughs> and that switch spells out a future of oh so many troubles. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching this review. Anything that I happen to leave out, please, please feel free to bring up in the comments below. I'm more than happy to talk with you guys there and talk among yourselves too. So I'll be back next week, back with The Walking Dead and whatever else I've got time to talk about on this channel. So you guys take care of yourselves. And as always, I will be back before you know it.